And it looks like we are live for another episode of Technology in the Arts. I'm Brian Kelly. I'm John Lamasny. And uh, we're going to explore the connections between technology and art once again. John, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Brian. How are you? I'm doing excellent. Well, uh, what's up? What, you been up? what have you been up to lately? Uh, well, the open of the semester, of course, is always a really busy time. And usually at this point, it starts to calm down a bit. And it just hasn't calmed down yet. So I'm really waiting for the newness of the semester to wear off. You remember uh, what that was like. Uh, yep. It was always a crazy time when students and faculty come back and in instructional technology you're usually the first or second round of people that uh, everybody's looking for. So it's just been a really beautifully busy time and um, I'm excited about that, you know, moving on to the normalcy of October, in which we're now in, but we haven't really, we don't have the calmness yet. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, <laughs> I, I mentioned uh, something I had to do at Mercer County College, uh, Mercer County Community College, uh, last I'm week. I'm a little and, surprised that you talk about these things, actually. On the uh, well, I'm, I'm in a weird situation where I'm kind of free to pursue that. I'm just, you know, consulting right now, and I'm in that position because I wanted to seek another opportunity. So, I mean, I don't like openly talking about it, but it's a... Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I would probably say a fine institution in our area, because it could be any fine institution in our area. Yes. Right? Well, I haven't, I haven't specifically said what it was for. You were the one who kind of jumped into there. Oh, okay. Um, it, but basically... Uh, no, it's kind of interesting that uh, I there was a question posed to me at this thing that I never really thought about, and uh, it was using traditional public relations tools uh, in conjunction I'm just, with. I'm just interested. Why would they be sending you a question? If this was the committee. I'm saying if 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 we're not talking about. The, the reality of what you're doing, I'm interested as to why they would be sending you a question. You know what I mean? Like, there's context in your, in your story, right? It, yeah, they didn't send me the question. This was a question that was posed to me. <laughs> okay. During a meeting. Okay. And the meeting, the meeting was, okay. I'm yes. just interested. It was a meeting. How can you have a conversation about this and it not be clear exactly what you're talking about? Uh, because I'm never clear. Okay. So uh, that's my band name, Never Clear. Never Clear. Instead of Everclear. They had um, some hits in the 90s. Yeah. So um, So anyway, th there was this question about using traditional public relations tools in support of social media. And I never really thought of it that way. I always thought of social media helping being a, a tool to support your traditional PR uh, tools, uh, your, your press releases, your newsletters, um, you know, your static website or whatever. You know, I never really thought of uh, going the other way around, and it really stumped me for a few seconds. I never got asked that question before, and it really stumped me, and I, I thought it was a disaster, but... Apparently not, because I, I'm going to have another meeting <laughs> with, with this fine institution in the central New Jersey area. Very good. So, Congratulations. Thank you. So hopefully uh, something works out there. I, I, I hope so for you, too. This same institution that's having this techno uh, the importance of technology in education uh, symposium. Well, maybe, uh, maybe I can talk Sean into uh, going and doing our podcast from that. Wouldn't that be cool? Doing a live, yeah, a remote hangout. Yeah, remote hangout. We actually, uh, I was talking with Rob about doing a remote hangout because that one's on fitness, and we were saying, wouldn't it be cool to like take a walk and sort of talk about walking, and do a hangout at the same time? It's it's only difficult because of the technology involved, but um, yeah, and that's very similar to something else 
Yeah, well, I, that that's I, what I said to him almost immediately was uh, we could probably do it audio only, but I, I think the video might be tough. Go go tell him to go listen to that podcast. Yeah, as if as if it could be found. It can be found. It's very yeah, easily that's found. True. It's still there. It's are all those on archive.org? They should be. You know what though? Archive.org changes the lo- they change servers. The podcasts get lost and I have to re- I have to find them again. And and put the correct URL. Sure. They, they change the URL over time. And it, it doesn't stay consistent. So I have hard noticed to, that. I've gone back. Complain. Hard to complain about archive.org given Right, the, it's free. <laughs> yeah, right. so I yeah, I'm not gonna complain about it. Just every now and then I have to go through and I'll, I'll go, Oh, I want to listen to this podcast again and it's not there and I have to go search for it in archive. But um you, you know, that was um I was gonna mention something. Oh, uh we we can talk about this offline, but uh, and I know you mentioned artworks uh, with this uh, Tuesday night thing, and yeah. I I saw something. Um, uh, I don't know if it's on Facebook. I think it was on Facebook. Art all day about that, and read up on some more. And, and I would really like to ask somebody about if they could you know, join us for one of these last technology in the arts for the 2012 season. Well, uh, it's funny you should say that. I have a couple friends. I've made some connections with uh, artworks, and I'm almost certain that I could get uh, at least one of my friends to talk to us about it. But actually, we ought to be talking to Jesse Franco. True. Yeah. But uh, there's a couple cool things going on. They're, they're really embracing not only community, but they're also embracing... Uh, sort of the spirit of the season and they they are doing a couple things related to Halloween there's there's a art contest that uh, it it uh, focuses on sort of fear as a as a theme and um, they have monsters ball so they're they're doing some really interesting things cool yeah I, I, de- I definitely would like to uh, talk to them uh, if we can uh, you know we're in episode six and I don't know. Our viewers might not be aware, but we 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 basically agreed this week that we're going to do this for ten episodes. Correct? Yeah, I'm I'm thinking around ten, and and I think that'll be a nice round number. We'll be able to say most of what we want to say this time around, and uh, if we do it again, we'll we'll uh, do it again seasonally. You know? Right. Right. So we'll probably come back around with another series next year. I don't know if you noticed. I I, I call this hangout a series one, episode six. Yeah, <laughs> I, I did not have all that in my in my in my re status, but uh, <laughs> I I like how you formalize and compartmentalize. You know, it's it's interesting. So uh, yeah, um, so uh, what did you want to talk about tonight as far as technology and the arts? Right. So the other thing we were talking about, we had a little discussion about format. And we've gotten, I have gotten some feedback that these Hangouts are are great content. People really like the kinds of things that we're talking about, but not everybody has an hour to sit down and uh, listen, you know? Or or record them. I'm sorry? Or record them. Or record them, right. (laughs) Exactly right. And, like, I'm up to four now, and and there are more ideas, and I'm excited about the ideas, but it's taxing, and... um, Taxing in a, in a good way. And uh, so anyway, we're, we're trying to shorten it a bit, you know, trying to keep it, like, more to a half an hour. Uh, and when we go over, just not freak out about it. But we're going to try not to be done at 10 o'clock tonight, but more like, you know, quarter to 10. So um, good luck to us getting that to happen. Well, you know what? We did get off to a late start. So yeah, that's true. we probably started at ten after nine, so we could probably go to about ten of ten. Yeah. So, but m- closer to a half an hour. So, that if somebody really is interested in technology and art in in the area, you know, we'll try to keep it tighter and more about that. So, also, I mean, um, we we should just go on Facebook and put out a tweet, uh, a, a tweet, a status update. Uh, on each of our pages sort of asking if we can have some contacts from Art All Night because in in between your friends and mine, 
uh, we might get some interesting opportunities there. And um, yeah, so what did I want to talk about tonight? Uh, part of this reformatting is sort of talking about one topic and and pull and stretching it out a bit as opposed to talking about ten topics and not really being able to talk in length about them at all. And the topic I wanted to talk about tonight was uh, that I saw Mimi um, and she, uh, I, uh, Mimi in Princeton. Yeah. I, I can never remember how to say her last name, but she's Mimi. Yeah. And um, she posted on Facebook today that uh, Ai Weiwei, who is the sculptor who did the sculpture that is currently in Scudder's Plaza in Scudder Plaza in Princeton, next to the Woodrow Wilson School, also known as Johnson Hall, I think. Uh, Johnston Hall, probably. Robertson Hall? Robertson Hall. Uh, it's this beautiful sculpture, and um, I'll, I'll bring up my screen so you can see what it is that we're talking about. Um, so it's called uh, Circle of Animals, Zodiac Heads, and it's the 12 animals of the Zodiac. And here's a photo gallery, and these are what the pieces look like. They're huge. I mean, this is not only bigger than life, but, I mean, you could fit my head inside this, this head six times. It's, it's just a huge piece. And uh, it goes through the Chinese Zodiac. You know, there's um, oxen, here's tiger, and uh, I didn't find the site until today. I actually uh, was in the plaza one day and got, um, I was overheard talking to somebody sort of casually about the work, and they did an interview with me because I was interested in the work. And they asked what I knew about the piece, and I said, not a whole lot. And I wish I had seen the site, because uh, one thing that it showed me was that it is not a permanent installation. It looks like Princeton is going to house it until August 1st, 2013, a year <laughs> from the date of installation. And uh, that's really amazing. So I didn't really know about uh, Ai Weiwei either. And uh, the fact is, he's a cultural and social activist, and he's been oppressed because of this activism. And uh, I think that's really, really interesting and insightful and uh, says something about his work. And uh, anyway, the reason I mentioned Mimi is because she tweeted that, or she Facebook status. I don't even know why I'm saying tweeting. Probably because you, you mentioned Twitter just before. Sorry. Oh, wait, but I should take a lesson that never sorry. Sorry. What? It says never sorry on the website there. On yeah. his website. So anyway, never sorry is this, this uh, I'm assuming it's documentary. I have not even seen the trailer yet, and the trailer was what she shared. But I knew his name because I'm familiar with the, with the piece. Right. And uh, it looks like it's going to be big, good. And... Uh, he also apparently is coming in October to speak at the Woodrow Wilson School uh, about his piece. And I don't have the date for that right in front of me, but um, if you do a search on Ai Weiwei and Princeton, it will probably pop right up. Uh, and it says here, uh, Never Sorry is the inside story of a dissident for the digital age who inspires global audiences and blurs the boundaries of art and politics. First-time director Allison Clayman gained uh, unprecedented access to I while working as a journalist in China. Her detailed portrait provides a nuanced exploration of contemporary China and one of its most compelling public figures. So I think that uh, it looks like it's going to be a great uh, documentary. And more importantly, I'm, I, I'm glad I found a couple sites to learn a little bit more about this piece. I'm going to do some investigation and see what it's about because just as a visual set of objects, it's just a beautiful piece and exquisite, very expensive. It requires 
um, a place that can support it. You know, if, the, if these heads were just out in a field somewhere, I don't think they would have the same power, or possibly they would be more powerful. I haven't seen the other installation sites, but where it is is particularly effective for what it is. And um, I was surprised to hear that it was not part of the permanent collection. And um, for those of you who don't know, Princeton houses an amazing sculpture collection, outdoor sculpture collection, including uh, Alexander Calder pieces, a Picasso piece, uh, Henry Moore, a Ricky, a um, George Ricky piece, a mobile uh, stainless steel piece. And maybe my favorite piece, um, a Richard Serra piece that's right behind the building that I work in. But this piece is uh, was a surprise. I didn't know anything about it. It just showed up one day. And uh, just a, a beautiful piece to spend some time with. If, if you ever have a half an hour to just go and sit with a sculpture, you, you could do much worse than to spend right. some time with this one. Of course, you should also point out that the building you work in is is actually somewhat sculptural. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it's a uh, Frank Geary building. It's the Lewis Library, Lewis Science Library at Washington and Ivy. And um, thanks, Brian, because all the stalkers are going to come murder me now. I, you were the one who pointed it out. I was just saying it was sculptural. I don't have any stalkers. What, are you crazy? So... Uh, yeah, the, that, that's all I really wanted to talk about was to make people aware of uh, Ai Weiwei and this forthcoming documentary, which hopefully will be available at places like the Ritz, Ritz at the Bourse in Philly and maybe have wider distribution too. Uh, but also, if you've ever seen the Zodiac Heads piece in Princeton and you want to know more about the artist, and, and uh, I certainly want to know more about what that piece has to do with his political activism, um, I'm um, I'm excited to find out. I'm I'm really looking forward to it. Excellent. What about you? What do you want to talk about? Well, uh, you know, I had heard about this uh, a couple weeks ago, and I kind of forgot it. And then I uh, came across it again today, and it's this um, interactive installation, I guess, uh, in Philadelphia. And let me uh, go to my screen share here and let's see if it actually does something there we go I press the button I don't know if it's doing anything do you want me to tell you or do you want to be surprised when you see it <laughs> I see it okay I have it in another window okay so open air, it's this, um, there are these lights, I guess they're 24 robotic search lights that react both in brightness and position to your voice's frequency and volume. And basically, I think you can go to the website or there's an iPhone app, a free iPhone app where you can record a message and it gets translated into light. And then that light gets projected over the Ben Franklin Parkway in Center City, Philadelphia. And that is going on until uh, October 14th. It started the sep uh, September 20th. And I think there was actually a, a concert. I think there was a composition titled Open Air that, that kind of went with this. Um, but, yeah, it kicked off at the uh, 24th Street in the Parkway. Oval. So uh, I don't know if anybody has been to Philadelphia since this has been in place. Um, there's kind of a mixed reception apparently. Some astronomers uh, are upset with the additional light pollution um, in Philadelphia. But I kind of like these types of things where the public gets to interact with and control uh, the uh, visual art piece that's going on overhead. Uh, we talked about something like this uh, back in the day on the Technology and the Arts podcast, the original podcast, where you could... Um, there were some lights on a building, I think it was in Sweden, maybe, where you could 
dial in. It was like a phone based thing. You could dial in and and have the uh, lights in a, on a building go in a certain sequence. Yeah. So, um, I kind of like these uh, these types of installations, but I can see the point. You know, I'm sure you know these searchlights. What they you know who knows if they're shining in the people's you know apartment windows, um, but kind of cool and I, I haven't been to Philly and I don't think I'm going to be getting to Philly anytime soon so um, just wanted to see if maybe if somebody can leave a comment whether on the YouTube page or uh, on the blog if they've been to Philly and, and taken part or uh, seen the uh, lights from uh, open air it would be uh, interesting to hear from people yeah I agree uh, by the way, in our comments um, for my post of the link to the video, I'm doing a synopsis of what we're talking about, but I'm also mentioning a couple people who I know are associated with artworks. Oh, excellent. Uh, also, uh, just to, uh, since uh, John didn't even know it existed, <laughs> going into uh, I should point out that I did set up a technology in the arts page on Facebook. So even though we're only going to have a few more episodes of this this year, I would like to kind of make it a a destination, I guess, even during the downtime of uh, posting interesting links dealing with technology in the arts, uh, maybe some videos or, you know, images. You know, we could post something that we want to share that could, you know, whether it's a something done in Inkscape or GIMP or a, a musical composition of mine or something, you know, every now and then. But yeah, I just I just liked it. Maybe you can uh, give me administrative rights. I will do that. All right, cool. So I just wanted to mention that. And uh, speaking of which, actually, it's not the the Facebook page, but. Uh, um, we had talked about, and, and uh, I, I already did a, a post. Uh, we're gonna, tr John and I talked about uh, offline, doing a feature, I guess, over these next few weeks that we're gonna be doing this, where I post something that I created, John would post something he created, um, kind of share it with the community in general, and then we would kind of talk about. You know, the piece, what the thought process, process that went into it, the technology that went into either the inspiration or the creation of it. So, um, I guess, John, if if you want to take a look at the the blog, as we uh, on the fly here, I don't know if you want to uh, take a look at what I posted, just as kind of a test run. Yeah. Um... I'm actually looking for an easy link to it from the Facebook page. Uh, it does I... not look as though there is a link. <sighs> I rushed that thing. All right, hold on. And it does not look... Let's see. There it is. Yeah, there it is. So let me. Uh... Head on over to that. Oh. There we go. All right. So this is the post I. Uh, I put on the blog and. If anybody hasn't seen the blog, uh, there's the, uh, the page here. So, yeah, I, um, <laughs> I don't know what we're going to call this. I just use in perspective because it was something we used back in our podcast days, and then we got rid of that too. But um, to, this is kind of a test post. But anyway, this is, this is kind of something I, I, I envision where we post something that we created, put a couple of words about it, although I went a little too far on this. But... Um, 
and then we just kind of talk about the the influences, how technology. Oh. You have a little bit of a uh, John Oates thing going on there. John Oates thing where? In the photo next to the uh, right here? SoundCloud, yeah. It's funny. Some uh, my friend Jason thought I, I looked like Prince a little bit. Yeah, it's you definitely. If, if Prince and John Oates got together, <laughs> Poats. <laughs> or the artist formerly known as Oates. So okay, so basically, I've as uh, John and I discussed on the first hangout, technology and the arts hangout. Um, I've gotten back into electronic music uh, after kind of, you know, I've, I've been spending a lot of time playing accordion lately, um, at least over the last couple of years, uh, for my friend Christian Beach, and, you know, really concentrating on singer-songwriters, but I've always liked the 80s stuff. I, you know, if you can see this picture here, this is my keyboard rig back in the day. Is that going to, yeah, it's, it's trying to enlarge the photo. I, I don't see the enlargement because all you did was share the window, not your desktop. No, it. Do you see it now? Now I see it. Yeah. Yeah, it was loading. Okay. So yeah, this is from like I don't know, 1990 or so. There's by, like an insomnia. By the look of, by the, look of the jeans. Definitely yeah. 1990. Yeah. So th this, th that's when I had my Insonic uh, ESQ1, my Insonic Mirage sampler, and an HR Alasis HR16 drum machine. Uh, this is a Roland U U20 synthesizer, I think. Um, oh, and and up, you can't really see it, but there's a, a KY uh, Q80 uh, 32 track sequencer on top of the Mirage as well. So anyway, so I was yeah, I was into electronic music back in the day, but you know, kind of gotten away from that. And even though I still listen to it every now and then. Um, and I'm always going to be a fan of 80s music, but um, the opening ceremony, the 2012 London Olympics, kind of got me into it again. Uh, Underworld did most of the music, but you know it was high contrast and and others. And I I got I bought that soundtrack like the next day and listened to it for like two weeks straight. It was it was I loved it. I loved the uh, the main theme that was um, that Underworld did. Uh, it was called and we will. And we shall kiss, or and we will kiss, or something like that, which was like the epic 17-minute thing that talked that 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 was played with the history of England and all that stuff during the ceremony, and it's just an amazing composition. And um, I I first went back into my archives, something that I had worked with my friend Christian Beach, even though he's a singer-songwriter now, he was also in electronic music. Something that we uh, wrote together. Um, a while back, uh, you know, back in the early 90s and kind of updated it, but this was something new and it, I kind of uh, went back to that conversation that you and I had about dubstep and I don't know if you, let me see if I can even play this and I don't know if you can be able to hear it, you should be able to hear something. But as I mentioned in that discussion, I'm more of a chill wave person, and, and, and this it's kind of played into that more than dubstep. But when it came to the bridge, okay, yeah. I, uh, yeah, okay, here we go. Can you hear that? Not really. How about now? Nope. Ah, okay. Well, if you listen to about, I don't know, about the 320, 330 mark, I guess, um, the bridge kind of speeds up a little bit. Well, it has an appearance that it speeds up. And then I, I put in a little kind of a drop just to kind of hearken to dubstep, and that was in your honor. Oh, well, thanks. So I, 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 I wanted to give a little nod to Dubstep since uh, I spent that entire episode, you know, berating its credibility. I'm, I'm going to have to go and uh, appreciate that. 
I mean, it's not true dubstep, but it, it, there's definitely a, a, like a little drop, and I tried to get into that whole like sluggish. Is it thing. more like is it more like Transformers during foreplay than Transformers having sex? No. Well, that, have you never heard that that uh, dubstep is like Transformers having sex? No, I, I've never listened to the. I, I've never heard the. Uh, the. Uh, we we really need to sit down. And I will I will let you hear why I love dubstep. Okay, but anyway, you know, part of this is I mentioned in that first episode where I bought the um, Alesis uh, twenty five key MIDI controller because you know with my son, I have a keyboard rig down in the basement, but I don't really want to bring my kid down in the basement. First of all, it's not the cleanest part of our house, and uh, again, probably not something you need to broadcast. Well, it's a basement. Uh -huh. but, um, so I, you know, and I'm watching him at, at night. So I, I wanted to get like this little, you know, controller to to bring around the house wherever he is, you know, so I can, if I have the, you know, the moment strikes, don't want to, you know, write something real quick, you know, I'll just play it in, on the little 25 key keyboard, and uh, you know, so this was the first thing I I think I really wrote on that. And um, what was funny is I, I didn't have a title for it. And I guess this is kind of the an, another technolo technology related part about this, you know, uh, this, the creation of this song is that I posted it to SoundCloud as I think un untitled 828 2012, which was the, which was the uh, date I uh, recorded and uploaded it. And somebody commented on it saying, you know, this is chill as, man, I'm going to be clean tonight. So okay. he's like, I like it. So that's where the title came, chill as F, because that was what he said it was. So so hopefully if you listen to it, you know, maybe you can comment next week. But that's, this is <coughs> kind of like what I want to do, just kind of post something that we've created, talk about the the creation of it, you know how technology plays a role. Obviously, you know, it's electronic music. There's a lot of well, one. One thing that I can say um, about it is uh, that I love the fact that you use SoundCloud because uh, of just what you mentioned. You're able to start a conversation in the same way you're able to start a conversation in so many other places. Right. And you know how. If you if you're using Foursquare, you're using Yelp, or you're using anything that reposts to Facebook, and somebody responds and says, "Oh yeah, I had that experience too," and you're able to engage in a in a thread, like right. that's the point, right? Right. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of cool. You know, I have I've gotten a few comments on my uh, on my creations. I, I think a lot of it's you know spam, but some of it seems. Uh, Seems genuine. This obviously seems genuine. This is the first time I ever got a timed comment in one of my SoundCloud pieces. Usually they'll put a general comment. But this is the first time somebody put a time comment. And what's interesting about SoundCloud, um, even though it, I think it's a, it's a, you have to pay, you have to get into the premium services, which I, I did, um, is the, you know, for relatively low price for per year. Um, it's like what, twenty five bucks a year? Some of that maybe. 30 something I, I, I can't remember it was in pounds I think <laughs> or euros I don't remember but um, uh, you can actually edit the sound file uh -huh. so you can replace the sound file so as long as you don't change the timing so I, I, I did a remix I I was listening to it a few more times I, I didn't like the way uh, I added some drums. I, I didn't like the drums in the bridge. I, I wanted them a little more powerful, so I, I added some more drum sounds in the bridge and didn't change anything else to the song. And I was able to replace the, the file and the comments, any timed comments, will stay in, in the same spot. So as long as you don't change the timing of the song, the comment should stay where it is. Hmm. So... If you change the length of the song, then the time comment's going to be, you know, messed up. Yeah. But it's All nice right. that they—it's nice that it gives you that 
flexibility where if you want to, you know, do a remix or, or you know, fiddle around with the, the volumes or you want to add or take out a part, you know, you can do that and then upload a new version of it. And it won't Agreed. affect that, your... Uh, I, there's, there's actually a lot of... The fact that it's embeddable is another great thing, you know, that's surprisingly not... I can't think of um, a lot of other services aside from like YouTube. If I just put up a single frame on top of an audio piece, that would be as easy to embed as SoundCloud. Yeah, and a lot of you could do it with uh, archive.org, but there, you yeah. would lose all of the commenting functionality. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a nice site. I I. I... Would like to get Christian on it, <laughs> but he's you know he's not really you know doing much these days. But I think that's going to be changing soon. Well, it's with the reemergence of MySpace. Yeah, see that was the thing I was talking about last week though, where <laughs> where we, you talked about Spotify. What I was talking about as far as music, what were independent artists? You know, Facebook took away the music player where you could upload anything. You could upload a song, one of your songs, and you would have a player. And they took that away, and they actually integrated with MySpace because MySpace still had that functionality where you can upload tracks, your own well, tracks. Well, how about Google Play, where anybody who wants to can put up any audio of any kind with a price tag or without a price tag and make it available for uh, download? Right, but that was that was the thing I was talking about with Facebook, with, with, with how why MySpace was still big with musicians because Facebook took away any in-house music uploading and playback features. And MySpace still had that. People were used to it, and they stayed on there. I'm not saying that other places didn't have it or, or other. It's just that MySpace was good for music, and people stayed on there because it was easy to use. And that part of it. Horribly was, ugly, but, yes, easy to use. Yes. Yeah. But now it's pretty. It just rips off several other. Yeah. Somebody, somebody, it's like, uh, it's like, oh, so is MySpace actually rebranding itself as Pin Tumblr? Right. So. It's, I mean, I, I've also heard comments that it looks a lot like Windows, the new Windows, and um, I disagree. I think it looks exactly like Pinterest, but. Yeah. 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 It doesn't look like. It doesn't look like new Windows at all. No. I don't see that. All right. So, uh, do you have anything else you want to talk about? Uh, just uh, real quick. Um, real quick. I have to bring it up because uh, I, I said I would, but the uh, fall season finale of Doctor Who on Saturday was was slightly uneven in places, but the ending was just so beautifully heart wrenching <laughs> that. It, you know, I, I I didn't really think about the stuff that didn't make sense, like how the Statue of Liberty can be a weeping angel when everybody in New York City is looking at it, and the weeping angels don't move when they're being observed. So, I mean, there was that. So, but the ending for Amy Pond and Rory Williams as the companions of the Eleventh Doctor, the their their exit was was really powerful. I, I I'll admit I cried. Did you just uh did you just spoil it? No, everybody knew they were leaving. Oh. I, I didn't just, I just <laughs> Well, people, Doctor Who fans knew they were leaving. Oh. I knew they were I knew they were leaving. I knew when I watched the filming back in April that I was watching the final episode that they were going to be in. But <laughs> What's funny is that I, I think I mentioned that I something that I saw during the filming I thought was going to be a resolution, but it turned out to be a red herring. And, oh, I, cool. I, and I think they put... There were these old people walking along the bridge with this blonde-haired girl, and there, were some, there was some speculation among the Doctor Who fans that were there of who those people were. But... Uh, uh, but no, it was it was amazing. I mean, the ending was was very very touching, and I I I I am not ashamed to admit I I cried. 
I'm I'm glad that you found your emotional side, Brian. It's it's a sign of maturity. I uh, I cry all you the time. You know what it was? You know what it was? It, it, in sports movies, The Field of Dreams, there's this, you know, there's this one scene where for for a guy who's watching a baseball movie, there's this one scene where at the end that you think, "Oh, you know, that, that's so heart-wrenching." And it it brings you to the verge, but you don't really cry. And then there's just when you you're you're getting your your emotions in check, then all of a sudden it's like bam, they hit you with another tear jerking moment, and you you lose it, you lose it. And and that's what Stephen Moffat did with this episode, where just when you thought it was there was going to be a happy ending and you can compose yourself. It was. He just went for the heart again. You're you're eating your nuts again, aren't you? Yeah, I am. Yeah. You know why? Because we're going long. Yes. Not too long. I said ten of ten, and it's nine fifty right now. So. Nine forty-five would have been better. Any any closing words? Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> and congratulations on your uh. Um, whatever is going on yeah. at Mercer County that you're so excited about. Uh, thank you. Hopefully that uh, works out. Uh, by the way, still, it, when I listen to the outtakes from the from the final Technology in the Arts podcast, one of the, the best outtakes is when I say, John, anything you'd like to share with the audience? And you're like, not really. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been one of the drinking episodes. <laughs> Or one of the ice going into a big ice chest episode or girls Maybe. cackling in the corner table at, at Michael's or Crystal Diner or whatever. Those were fun days. They, those were well before the uh, availability of Google Plus as a solution. Yes. Yes. So, okay. I guess we are out of here. All right, Brian. Thank, thank you so much. And, thank you. Um, I'm looking forward to next week. Same here, and that concludes this episode of Technology in the Arts 2.0. I'll talk to you soon. See you later. Bye. Bye.